miracle when that I love stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above from the mountains to the prairies to the oceans wide with love God bless America Welcome to Life Spring Church. If you guys can all just move up and move in towards the center to leave room for people who happen to come in late. Happy Independence Day. We are so happy to see all of you this morning. Let's put our hands together as we worship the God who has given us the ultimate freedom. Amen. We worship. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be crying. We shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place, we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise, oh, oh, oh. we shout out your praise, we sing to the God who heals, we sing to the God who saves, we sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross, then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Come on, y'all. Beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be 
never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. We make a miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Jesus, you are. We make a miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Come on, sing it out. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are freedom, God. You are way maker, miracle worker. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Jesus, you are way maker, miracle worker. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 That is who that is who you are. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for the freedom that you have given us through the death of your son, Father. We thank you. We thank you for everything that you have blessed us with. We thank you for being able to live in this country with the freedom that we have, Father. We thank you for everything. We magnify your name, Father. sing this next song just lift your hands just say thank you father thank you for everything thank you for everything that you've done
<sighs> you all may be seated. Happy 4th of July. We wave high the flag of freedom as a patriotic reminder to never take our independence for granted. Fireworks explode into the night sky, lighting up the darkness, reminding us of our nation's calling in the world. One nation under God. We look into the sky and remember that for all the freedom we have to celebrate, we must never forget our dependence on God. It was by His hand we were afforded our independence. So we might stand for liberty, remembering He set us free from the bondage of sin. So we might stand for justice, for the Lord loves justice and He will not forsake His saints. So we might stand for freedom, because we know that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We thank you, God, for the beautiful gift of our country. May we always depend on you to sustain us. Amen. Oh, come on. I thought you were a little more thankful for our country than that. Yeah. I, I hope we never forget it's one nation under God. Amen. I hope you all got a little flag as you came in. If you didn't, there's some at the back or someone can give you one. Uh, I want us to go a little Pentecostal today, if it's okay with you. Um, in, in, not okay with you, Robert? Okay, well, everybody, let's pray for Robert right now. Meaning, Pentecostal meaning that if you, uh, if you want to say amen, when I was a kid, and went to a Pentecostal church, there were people waving white hankies in the air, you know? Well, you've got a flag in the air, so you can wave that if you want, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. If you want to say amen, you can shout amen. amen. You, can, you, can, you, can, you can wave your flag if you don't want to say amen. You can just wave it, or you can shout, you can do both. Or you can text it to me if you want to. Uh, not 214-497-7206. Just text me an amen. That's fine, too. Uh, all right. Amen. Hey, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Father, we're so thankful for what you've already done and what you already have planned in this service today. We are so thankful for, uh, Lord, this country, the greatest nation in the world, I believe, in the greatest state in the world. That's just me personally, Texas, Lord. Thank you for our freedom. Thank you for our uh, government officials who are working hard to try to keep that freedom Lord, we lift them up in prayer. We, uh, Lord, we pray that more Christian, more, more believers, more Christians, more people that belong to you will rise up and seek government office and we vote them in and uh, take back this country, Lord. We thank you and praise you for who you are, what you've done, and the freedom that we have where the Spirit of the Lord is. There is freedom. We set aside all distractions and we want to hear from you, Holy Spirit, today in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I thought my cousin did an outstanding job last week of, uh, about speaking on Daniel. And so we've got a series uh, this summer that we're doing called Heroes. And basically what it is, is we pick a different Bible character that you may have heard of or you may not have heard of. And so today, I'm going to pick one that has no name. In fact, I'm going to pick a Bible hero that was a 12-year-old girl. And she, the Bible doesn't mention her name. She had a name, but we don't know what it is. The Bible just mentions her as a servant girl. So what can we learn from a Bible hero called a servant girl? I mean, first of all, it says a lot that she wasn't all about her name. And the Bible didn't mention her name, but it was about she made a difference and made an impact on this world and was mentioned in the Bible because of one act of faith. So I want to talk about that. But before I do... I want to show you where I went last week. We wanted to do something patriotic, and we, we uh, yes, thank you. And while I'm, while I'm mentioning that, if you've served in our military or are serving, would you, would you please stand up? We want to honor you and thank you today for our freedom. Thank you, men. Thank you. And it kind of goes along the, with the Christian message, because of your sacrifice, we have freedom. Because of one man's sacrifice, Jesus, we have freedom, right? 
So uh, this was very moving. I it's very beautiful up there too in South Dakota. And uh, there, there's canyons and hills and there's a town that's western and they have a shootout every, every day at noon. And uh, it was kind of fun to just go and experience all that. And some of you may have saw my Facebook post on the backside of Mount Rushmore. But anyway, you can look that up later. <laughs> what that's all about. But uh, let's look at the Word. Let's look at Romans chapter 6. Because what I'm about to read you is a passage that Paul wrote that basically says, we're all a servant of something. We all serve something. Now we can choose to serve God, or we can choose to serve sin, to serve the world, to serve ourself. But let's look at how he phrases it. He says, and I hope you don't have a problem with this word, but when you were slaves, I mean, that kind of, we kind of have a bad uh, impression of the word slave, but if you want to, I mean, some translations say when you were servants or when you were, uh, you know, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. When people are born in sin, they usually don't do what's right, right? I mean, is it, is it a surprise to you that hunters go hunting? Is it a surprise to you that golfers go golfing? So is it a surprise to you that sinners sin? Shouldn't be. And like Paul said, hey, chiefest of them all. You know? So, and what was the result? You are now ashamed of the things you used to do that end in eternal doom. How many of you have bad choices that you made at one time in your life and you wish you could do a, a do-over? You wish you could have a time machine and go back? Thank you for, for raising that hand, and you wanted to raise both hands and both, me too. You know, if we go back, we would do things differently. But then Paul goes on to say, but now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God or committed to God or servants of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. Basically, what he's saying is we don't have to be a servant to sin anymore. We can be a servant of God. But it's always sad to me, and I've done it before, maybe you've done it before, when somebody who uh, is, is, is saved is a Christian, but makes bad choices and opens the door to the enemy. And you may be, you may be sitting here today going, well, man, I, I don't know what you've done. I, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never done that. Let me go down just a list of things that open a door to the enemy. And this is just a small list. I'm about to do a series on this because I see the number one problem in this church and in churches all over America and in churches all over the world. You know what it is? And not many people preach on this. It's demons. Now, don't, don't, don't shut me off. Don't roll me out. Don't get afraid and run out of here. Demons are real. They're fallen angels, they're fallen spirits, and not a lot of pastors will talk about this. But the truth is, Paul said, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It's not the flesh. I, I've talked to many people and they go, oh man, it's just my old flesh rising up. And I want to say, no, it's not. It's a demon that's influencing you to make a bad choice and quit listening to the devil. But this is the number one. Let me, let me just go over some things that... You may, you may, well, I, Pastor, I've never opened a door to the enemy. Well, let me go down this list, and, and I've probably done about half of these things. Generational sins and curses, unforgiveness, judgment, the occult. Anybody ever read their horoscope? Sexual sin, pornography, ungodly soul ties, pride. That just got us all right there. If it didn't, well, that wasn't me. Well, that, that you're probably the biggest one. <laughs> broken vows or covenants, severe abuse or trauma, addictions, fear, lust, gossip, failure to pray, failure to tithe, anger, bitterness, jealousy, gluttony, uh -oh. hurts, wounds, offenses, greed, Unbelief, stealing. 
That's only 26 ways to open the door to the enemy. But I bet that if we went around the room, we could say, hey, which one was yours, Robert? We'll start with, no, I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. <laughs> He'd go, man, that, just about all of them. <laughs> Ungodly soul ties. That's, that's being, uh, allowing someone to influence you that is speaking lies or speaking from the, the Bible says lies come from hell. And, and they're, uh, you're influenced by someone who's not godly. So you have to be careful who you let influence. That can open a door to the enemy. But I would dare say that all of us in here has one of those that we've opened a door. Now let me, let me explain what I'm talking about. <clears throat> if I would have left the house this morning and rushed out the door, the front door let's say, and left it wide opening, there is a chance that I could come home and somebody that I don't know that is uninvited will be in my house, right? Am I, am I speaking dumb here or is, is that a chance? And if I leave it open long enough, I can almost bet 100% that eventually someone will be there because how many of you know there's people out there that aren't godly that are watching for open doors and looking to steal destroy and kill, right? And so if I leave my door open and I come home from church and all of a sudden, boom, there's somebody in there that's there to steal, kill, and destroy. And I've gone, uh-oh, what happened? Well, what happened was I left an open door. And the same thing is true in the spiritual world. We don't realize it, but this list I read, and there's hundreds of these, we leave an open door and Satan comes walking in. One of his demons comes walking in and has influence in our life. And we make bad decisions. We go to sin. We do bad choices. Are you with me so far? The Bible talks about this. The only way, and if you came home and that was the case, the only way to deal with it is you would have to bind that person up or handcuff him or arrest him and take him out of your house. And the Bible says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. So the Bible gives us spiritual authority. And in Jesus' name, we can close the door and say, Father, forgive me. I repent and I close the door to this sin. And Satan, you are not welcome in my house. Get out. I bind you in Jesus' name. I arrest you. Get out of my house. So I'm talking about freedom today. Because I see a lot of people that uh, belong to God but are having battles because we unknowingly opened a door. And, and guess what? The Bible even goes on. And I'm going to do a whole series in the fall. So I, after Labor Day, I, I hope you all will tell your friends and family, hey, you've got you to be here for this. Because every one of us has battles and things we struggle with. And so uh, the Bible says that even after you do that, if you open the door again, which I've done before, we've done before, right? He brings seven of his ugly cousins with him. Hey, Bob, there's an open door. Hey, Joe, there's an open door. Hey, Fred, there's an open door. You know, and then everybody comes, all of his seven others come. And now, you, you really got trouble, right? So some of you are doing some math. Right? I've got 7,000. Oh, I'm just kidding. So... <laughs> Close the door, get them out, don't invite them back, keep the door closed, amen? So, I want to tell a story today about two servants. Because Romans right here says, we can either choose to serve God and be a servant of God, or we can choose to serve the world and sin and self, right? That's the two choices. Do you, do you agree with me? So, that's, that's, that's where it's at. There's no in the middle. You're either going to serve God. The Bible says in, in the end, in, in judgment... There's going to be the left and the right, so sheep and the goats. So there's only two ways to go. Which kingdom do you serve? So uh, here we have in 2 Kings chapter 5 a story of a servant girl. So I want to talk about the, the two servants today, the tale of two servants. And the servant girl, first of all, is she let her faith, now listen very carefully, she let her faith define who she was, not circumstances. I want to I tell you the story, and then I'm going to read certain passages. But basically, 
They're uh, about uh, 840-ish years before Christ. There was uh, Israel was being invaded by the Armenians. And the king of Aram, his name was Ben-Hadad II, he um, had a commander of his army that was a stud. This dude was the baddest dude in the land. And in fact, the Bible says that God blessed, gave victory to, the, to Aram because of this guy. And his name was Naaman. And he was a fierce warrior, but he had a problem. He was a leper. He had leprosy. And uh, so, but he was still out there fighting battles. And so, the, the king of, uh, 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 so uh, they invaded Israel. And often when another country invades a country, especially back in this day, they would take captive wives. They would take captive daughters. They would take captive sons and gold and whatever else they could plunder. Now in this case, Naaman took a little 12-year-old girl so that he could set her aside to be the maid of the house and to be um, his, his wife, Naaman's wife, to be her maid and do all the house cleaning, do all the work of the house and all that kind of thing. And so, uh, so, he, so he took her there and then she said her one act of faith that made a difference she could have chose to focus on her circumstances and be bitter and say, man, here I was living a great life in Israel and all of a sudden, next thing I know, I turn around, I get kidnapped and I'm in a strange country serving a strange man with a strange wife and I'm their servant now and I'm their slave. And poor me and bitter, 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 resentful, resentful. She could have chosen to go down that road and she would have opened the door to the enemy. But instead, she did not let circumstances define who she was. She let faith define who she was. And she said to Naaman's wife, she said, hey, I wish Naaman would go see the prophet Elisha. And she said, he would be healed. That's faith. That's faith. I wish Naaman would go see the prophet Elisha and then he'd be healed. And so, uh, so the story goes on, and so Naaman goes back to the king and said, my wife was talking to the maid, and here's what they said, and I want to go see this. Now all of a sudden, faith is contagious. Yeah. Now all of a sudden, Naaman gets a little fat. I want to go to the prophet because I want to be healed. I'm sick of itching and this leprosy, and it's horrible, and I don't want to deal with it anymore. I want to be healed. And the only way to have freedom and deal and get victory over addictions is bring them to God and have faith. And so, Naaman, he, he tells the king, the king writes a letter and sends it over to King Joram over Israel, which, by the way, was uh, Ahab and Jezebel's son, who Ahab and Jezebel were the most wicked people, the Bible says, in Israel's history. And their son is king of Israel right now. And so, he reads the letter and he shreds his clothes and says, what is this king of Aram doing? He's... He's just trying to agitate me. He's just trying to pick a fight. And Elisha hears of this. He comes to the king and goes, Hey, king, don't worry. I got this. I got this. You just go about your business. I'll take care of this. So where it gets back to Naaman, get this. Naaman gets, ladies, you're going to love this, 10 wardrobes. Not just clothes, but wardrobes. 10 wardrobes. Matching shoes. You know, if, 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 uh, if Elisha would have been a lady, it would have been, you know, uh, Jimmy Choo or whatever y'all love. Slingbacks. I don't know. I'm speaking out of my league right now. I don't know. Louis Vuitton. I don't know all that stuff. Doesn't matter to me, but apparently it matters to y'all a little bit. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I asked my wife one time, how many pair of shoes do you have in the closet? She goes, 50? I said, that's a lie. You got more than that. But anyway, we won't go there. I might, I, I might get a glare and I might have to, you know, God bless you, America. <laughs> Just kidding. I love you, babe. You're worth every pair and then some. I'll buy you some more shoes if you want. But, uh-oh, she's making a list now. Uh, I hear nothing. But, but back to the story. So, so Naaman, he, this is what he brings. 
He brings 150 pounds of, of gold with him, uh, 750 pounds of silver, and 10 wardrobe changes. I did the math in today's economy. It was, the gold was worth $4,279,200. The silver was worth $314,520,000. And the wardrobe, everything together, was over $4.6 million. So this dude, and he's not, he can't carry it all himself. He's got an entourage of servants and people that have bags of gold and bags of silver and wardrobe changes because he's going to bless the man who changes his life. And he has faith that he's going to be healed, and he comes with all this stuff to say, hey, I'm going to give this to you. And so he gets to the house of Elisha and knocks on the door, and Elisha said, Elisha, he already knew he was coming. Elisha was a man of prayer, a man of spiritual things. He could see things. And so he said, hey, Gehazi, go down there. Gehazi was Elisha's chief servant. Go down there and tell Naaman that God's going to heal him, but he's got to go into the river Jordan and dip seven times and then come up and he's going to be a healed man. And so Gehazi tells him that and Naaman storms off mad. First of all, he's a man of nobility. He's a man that's used to people bowing when he walks in. He's the greatest general of the time. He's, he's got a lot of honor to him, even though he's a leper. And he comes in and, he, and the man of the house doesn't even come to greet him. The servant comes to greet him and gives him the message. So he's kind of walking off mad, and his officers calm him down, like, hey, hey, come on now, you know, uh, don't be so mad. This man of God told you to do this. He said, yeah, but the rivers in Damascus are much more clear. Abana and, and Far Far, those rivers are much more clear than the River Jordan. Why don't I go there? And they go, look, it's not hard, Elisha. Just go down, do what the prophet says, seven times, you'll be healed. Now, now the, the oh, see the faith. It started with the servant girl. It was over to Naaman, and now it's the officers. There's a lot of faith going on here. You're going to be healed. And so uh, Naaman goes down to the Jordan River. He dips down one time, comes up, dips down another time, comes up a third time, comes up fourth time, comes up fifth time, comes up sixth time, and... How many of us would have quit right there and said, this is stupid? There's people staring at me. You know what I have freedom of? When I come into church and worship starts, I do this, and I don't think this is stupid. You can think it's stupid if you want, but I do this because I'm free in my worship. I don't have a problem with it. And, and I want the world to know, if you think I'm stupid, I'm stupid for God then. So, but anyway... He goes down a seventh time and comes up. And the Bible says his skin was like baby's skin. A miracle, a healing miracle. And you know what comes out of his mouth? Naaman says, surely the God of these worlds don't matter at all, but the God of Israel is the only God. Yes. Amen. And, and I believe that Naaman's in heaven. And I believe that I'll, get, I'll go to him one day and I'll, I'll get a corner in heaven and maybe we'll have some uh, Chick-fil-A, you know, God's chicken together. I don't know. But we'll have something and I'll, I'll talk and say, Naaman, tell me all about it, man. Tell me, were you frustrated? How did you feel? And going down on that fifth time, were you going like, oh, this is so stupid? Or what, what was going through your mind? And, you know, he might say something like, I don't know, but that seventh time I came up with baby skin, bro, and that's all that matters. I completed the assignment that God asked me to do, and the miracle happened. Faith and obedience. And so, so he does that, and then he, he uh, oh, I forgot to tell you, by the way, when, when he offered all that gold and very important part of the story and silver and wardrobe, Elisha said, no thanks. But Elisha, I've got 4.6 million. Don't you have a building program in your church? I've got 4.6 million. No thanks. But, but you, can, you can donate to the poor. No thanks. You can use it for God. No thanks. And so he, he, he's healed. And so Gehazi begins to think about it. And he goes, man, I can't let this get away. He's the servant of Elisha. 
And he goes, I, I can't let, this, my master made a mistake. I want you to think about something. My master made a mistake, or my master's not right, or my master doesn't really know me, or that's how we get into sin. We justify it. We start with an excuse. We start with a justification. Oh, I do this because, well, me and God are good, but I just, you know, how many of you know what I'm talking about? We all justify and excuse our problems and our sins. And sometimes we, we don't call them demons. We call them weaknesses. And call them what they are. It's the only way to deal with it. And so he, he goes, uh, Ge Gehazi goes running after Naaman. He's taken off with all the gold. And so he goes, wait, 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 wait. And Naaman turns around, whoa, 12 horses or whatever it is carrying the chariots and all the entourage, whoa. And he steps down out of the chariot. He goes, is everything okay? And Gehazi goes, well, he's got to be quick thinking, you know. He says, my master, he changed his mind. He, he, there's a couple of guys coming in from Ephraim. And so he wants the two wardrobes. So, you know, give it to them. And uh, all, all he wants is a little bit of silver. In, in fact, it's just $31,452 worth of silver. And Naaman says, sure, take twice as much silver. Man, I'm a new man. Feel this arm, baby. I, take all you want. Take twice as much. And so the Bible says Naaman did. He took twice as much, went back to Elisha's house, and the Bible says, and this is how you know you're in sin, he hid, he hid the treasure in the master's house. I wonder how many of us hide what's going on when we come to the master's house. When this is the best place to say, God, I'm guilty. God, I'm messed up. God, I need you right now, right here in this moment. God, I repent. God, I shut the door to the enemy and demons get out of my life. I want to serve the kingdom of God. Right? Amen. <laughs> and, and so, so then, Elisha, Oh, this is a horrible... How many of you have ever been in the principal's office like I have? Thank you for that honesty. How many of you have ever made your mother just steaming mad? Or your father? Like, I, look at all those hands. Thank you for your honesty. My mom's sitting back there, a beautiful woman. And man, she was so mad at me one night. Just real quickly, we had New Year's Eve and, and uh, my sister... The curfew was 12 o'clock midnight, which was an hour extra. Usually it was 11 o'clock, but they allowed us to stay at 12... My sister got home about two. She got in big trouble. My mom was mad, you know, consequences. I think my dad was asleep already. I don't know what was going on. But then at six o'clock in the morning, my brother got home, and my mom was really mad, and he got a chewing, you know. I got home at six o'clock the next afternoon. <laughs> Guilty. Done some sin, done some wrong. Her eyes were bloodshot red and there was smoke coming out of her nose. Not really, not really, but pretty much. And man, was I in trouble. That must be how Gehazi felt at this moment because Elisha says exactly what my mom said. Where have you been? And he, he goes, well, he goes, uh, nowhere. And Elisha said, don't you know that I saw in the spirit, my spirit was there. And I saw the moment that Naaman stepped down out of his chariot and asked you if everything was okay. And this is not the time to be taking, this is not the time. And because you've done that, Gehazi, now you are going to have Naaman's disease. And you're going to have leprosy, not only you, but all your descendants for the rest of your life are going to have leprosy. And science has got it wrong. Science named it Hansen's disease. It should have been named Gehazi's disease or Naaman's disease. But anyway, even today, people that have leprosy may have been descendants of Gehazi. Isn't that terrible? But one servant, the servant girl, chose the path of freedom and getting away from bondage. One person, Gehazi, chose the path of bondage and no freedom. Are you with me? So my first point was she let her faith define who she was. Gehazi let his greed define who he was. Forever now, 
from when this happened forward, Gehazi was known as that greedy servant that got struck with leprosy. I could name some people that you've heard about in the news or some people that were famous and you would think of not what they're... You would, you would probably think of, of uh, what they did, the act that they did that made them famous, right? I won't, but you, you could. I could also name some heroes today that they're famous for their act of faith. But servant girl let her faith define who she was, name and let greed define. Secondly... And I'm, I'm going to close here in the next five minutes. She saw an opportunity to benefit another. You see, when you're choosing God's kingdom and to be a servant of God, you don't think about self, 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 self. In fact, Bible calls it a living altar or a sacrifice. In fact, we sacrifice the flesh and sacrifice what this wants on the altar to God and say, God, I'm here to lay that down and serve everybody else and see if I can influence and do one act of faith like that girl and see a, a Naaman get into the kingdom of God. And so that's why it's so important, so important that people back there right now that are serving, doing our little children, people that brought these flags down here today, people that sing and worship up here, people that uh, greet and make coffee out there, people that do whatever they're called to do, people that do all the stuff back there that make this church happen. It's so important to do that every week because of all of that, one person may get saved today or more. And it changes their eternal destiny. And so she saw an opportunity to benefit another. On the other side, on Gehazi, he saw an opportunity to benefit self. And I want, to, I want to go to this passage because I want you to see something interesting. 2 Kings 5, 21 through 23. It says, so Gehazi set off after Naaman. When Naaman saw Gehazi running after him, he climbed down from his chariot and went to meet him. Is everything all right? Naaman asked. And then... Gehazi said, yeah, my master has sent me to tell you that two young prophets from the hill country of Ephraim have just arrived. Now, the Bible doesn't say whether that's true or not. But let's just say it was true. Let's just say there were two guests. Well, first of all, it's a lie because his master didn't send him. So it's a lie right there. But let's just say there were two guests coming in. How many times do we justify our sins and get into bondage and get into a lack of freedom because we say, well, I'm doing this for my master. You know, I, sometimes, hey, will you, Robert, will you pray for Amy? You know, th let me tell you about all her bad stuff. You know, will you, will you pray for her? That's how we do it, right? We may not mean to, but we sit there and gossip and judge and Say things in, in the disguise of what you pray for. That's how we get into bondage. And so, it says that uh, Gehazi said, my master sent me, two guests are coming in, and would you give us 75 pounds of silver and, and two sets of clothing? So, servant girl let her faith define who she was, saw an opportunity to benefit others, and then third, one small act. I want you to get this. One small act. One, teaching the kids one Sunday. One, playing up here for altar call one Sunday. One, whatever God has gifted you to do, whatever you can do. One, just telling people at the 7-Eleven about Jesus. One small act can make a huge difference. And as we read the scripture here in, in 2 Kings 5, so Naaman went, Naaman told the king what the young girl from Israel said, go and visit the prophet, I'll send a letter, so on and so on. And then the, the next verse, letter king went to Israel. And then the next verse, verse 14, Naaman went down to the Jordan River, dipped himself in seven times as the man of God had instructed him, if we will do what God instructs us to do, we'll save a lot of problems in life. We'll have a lot of freedom instead of bondage. And his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child. And he was healed. And then the same point that I had for the servant girl is the same one for Gehazi. One small act. That one act of greed. That one act. You know, it's sad to say, 
But many parents grieve a lost child because of one bad decision one night to go do something they shouldn't have been doing and it ends up at a funeral. You know, one, one, one small act can make a big difference in life as we saw in this reads, the last passage here, 2 Kings 5, 24. When they arrived at the citadel, Gehazi took the gifts from the servants and sent the men back. He, he had so much silver and so much, he had to have some of Gehazi's, I mean, Naaman's servants to help him get all the treasure back to Elisha's house. And when he went into the master, Elisha asked him, where have you been, Gehazi? I haven't been anywhere, he replied. Elisha asked him, don't you realize I was there in spirit when Naaman stepped down from his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to receive money, clothing, olive groves, vineyards, sheep, cattle, male, female servants? There was more to the deal than we know. Because you have done this, you and your descendants will suffer from Naaman's leprosy forever. When Gehazi left the room, he was covered with leprosy. His skin was white as snow. Now let me ask you something. How many times have we done what Gehazi did and got a little greedy or got a little um, lustful or got a little selfish but because of God's grace do you hear me? Because of God's grace and mercy we're not dead. We're not uh, we, we have a, a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance and that's the good news. And I want to share with you real quick in the last two minutes because this has been a message about how one servant got into bondage and one servant got free. But I want to share with you, how do I, I hear you, Pastor Rex, I hear you what you're talking about here, but how do I get free? How do I get free? Well, the Bible tells us how to get free. And this is the good news of the message. The Bible says, in fact, in Romans 12 too, don't copy the behavior or the thinking or the customs or the culture of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way we think. Don't think I'm a drug addict, i got to have this drug. Think, no, I'm healed and I can be transformed and I'm a new creation by God's power. I'm free from that drug. we got several people in this audience here today that have been set free from those things because they changed the way they think and they got free. And then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. How about Ephesians 4, 23? Instead, let the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, speak to us. Renew our thoughts and attitudes. We just got to change the way we think. I'm no longer in bondage. I've been set free. And by the way, there are lots of scriptures that I'm willing to share with you that are about freedom. That if you're tempted to do the sin or the drug or whatever it is, you just start speaking the word. That's what Jesus did when the devil came up to tempt him. He started declaring the word of God. And that's the two-edged sword that defeats the enemy every time. Here's another one, another scripture for you. Colossians 3.10. Put on a new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. It's through the word. Last one, 1 Peter 1.13. Prepare your minds. That's where the battle is. That's where the addictions happen. That's where worry, stress, fear, all these things that open a door to the enemy, that's where it all happens. So why don't we prepare ourselves and realize that we're in a battle and do what Paul says, and I'm going to put on my helmet of salvation. I'm going to put on my breastplate of righteousness. I'm going to put on my, uh, my loin belt of truth, the gospel of shoes. I'm going to have my sword. I'm going to have the shield of faith. I'm going to have all that, and above all, I'm going to pray. And exercise, the Bible says, self-control. Put all your hope in the precious, in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So there is hope. There is freedom. And there is a way to break every chain, every bondage, everything Satan tries to put on us. You say, I, I, I hear those scriptures, but I need something more. Let me tell you something simple. Repent, the Bible says. And repent is a word that we think, turn away. It really means to change the way we think. Repent from the sin, change our way of thinking. 
Secondly, renounce. In other words, we need to say, we need to say, God, reveal this sin to me. Reveal this, reveal this bondage to me. I may not be aware, or maybe I am aware, but I renounce it in Jesus' name. I renounce fear in the name of Jesus. I renounce worry in the name of Jesus. I renounce lust in the name of Jesus. I renounce pornography in the name of Jesus. I renounce whatever open door that God has revealed in our spirit. And we renounce it in Jesus' name. We repent, we renounce, and we renew. God, I'm going to be in your kingdom. I'm going to be in your house on Sunday. I'm going to be in your word on Monday. I'm going to be in your spirit on Tuesday. I'm going to be every day. I'm going to do that self-discipline so that I can do what this church is all about to help people find God. I'll duck so you can see it. Find freedom, find purpose, and make a difference. If anybody asks you what's different about LifeSpring Church than every other church, those nine words, we help people find God, find freedom. That's, that's where most people find God and then they quit right there, but they go right back into bondages. So find God, find freedom, find purpose and make a difference. Will you bow with me as we go to the Lord in prayer today? And I hope that this message has blessed you. And let me tell you, I wasn't preaching at you. I was preaching at me because there are all, can pastors get into bondages? Oh, you bet. Absolutely, 100%. And there's times when I have to pray and say, God, I, and I'm in this bondage again. I've been worrying about this or I've been stressed out about this or I've been fearful or I've been this or that. And please forgive me. I didn't mean to, but I just opened a door and Satan came walking in. He's been playing with my mind. So God, forgive me. I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you reveal any open door that we have allowed Satan to come in and play with our minds. Forgive us, Lord. We repent right now. Will you just say, forgive us, Lord? Forgive, us. forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. And I hope the Holy Spirit is bringing something to your mind right now. Forgive me, Lord. And I renounce that sin. I renounce that sin in the name of Jesus. In other words, I refuse that sin. I'm closing the door. I'm picturing myself actually close the door of my heart so that God can get back up on the throne of my heart and close the door and say, Satan, I bind you in Jesus' name. I just say a prayer right now for everybody here who is really in their heart closing the door and we bind you, Satan, in Jesus' name and the power that you have and we kick you out of our temple in Jesus' name. The Bible says the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and so we kick you out of our temple right now in Jesus' name. And we cover it with the blood of Jesus and say no. And next time Satan tries to tempt us to open the door, we say, no way, get out and go to hell, Satan. In Jesus' name we pray that, Lord. We renounce it and we pray that you renew our hearts, renew our minds, renew our way of thinking, change the way we see things so that we can be free, God. We found you but we want to find freedom. And we do that today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, can you give God a hand of praise as Pastor Robert comes up? There's something real exciting next week we want to share with you about. Thank you, Pastor Robert. Yep. Hey, can we bring back up Romans 2? Something jumped out at me while I was looking here. Lisa, do you have that one? But it says in Romans 2, when she pulls it up, it says, don't copy behavior and customs of this world. And I was thinking about that as far as for America. America was a new idea and a new, they didn't copy anything from the world, but they created something new. And it just jumped out to me. They didn't, they didn't copy what was in the world. It says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you. And, and the, the, the founding fathers were godly men. These were men of faith, men of uh, 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 Christ followers, and they knew the scriptures that they knew this, and they didn't copy the behaviors of the world and the history that they knew, the kings and all that. They created something new, and I thank God for that, that we created something new here in America. And I just wanted to jump that, point that out to you today. Uh, <clears throat> hey, don't forget we have tithe and we have offering. Please, there's five ways to give. We want to continue to give. 
um, in person in the bucket, mail it in, text it in, the kiosk. Uh, what else? What did I miss? Online, text, something. Okay. I don't know. There's my wife there to help me. She's always there. My little helper. <laughs> but uh, uh, don't forget, uh, there's no men's and women's meeting tomorrow night. We're not having that. Enjoy. Uh, enjoy your day off. How many of you have a day off? I got the day off. Yes. All right. Enjoy your day off. If you want to cook me a burger, you can bring me a burger to my house. I, I won't say no. I like some burgers. Hey, George, we're close. You can cook something for me. Bring it over. <laughs> but uh, enjoy your time. Uh, please don't forget uh, baptismal next week. Thank you, Danny. You're my helper too. <laughs> baptism next week please come be a part that's when we we get to see people baptized and changed they're they're making their commitment to christ public so please come be a part of that let me pray a prayer of blessing over you and let's go in the joy of the lord dear heavenly father lord we just come before you today lord we say thank you Thank you for another week, Lord. We thank you that, that you created America, Lord, that we could serve you and worship you in freedom. Lord, we thank you for that freedom today, Lord God. We thank you that you died on the cross for our freedom and our, our forgiveness, Lord God. I pray that you would just uh, bless everyone who, who gives who gives today to the church and to, to those around, Lord. We pray that you would just bless the gift and the giver and that you would just let, allow us to, to go and, and share your word to someone this week, Lord. I pray that we can... We can change someone's life this week uh, with a positive word, with a word of Jesus, with whatever it is, Lord God, I pray we can change someone's life for you. Lord God, we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Done, the